Thank you very much uh, Lisa, thank you very much Creative Mornings for having me and good morning also from my side. This is pretty, um, as a pretty exciting um, occasion for me and also a pretty exciting location. I almost feel like in a church, it's a bit of an echo, so everyone who doesn't hear my speech directly, they hear it like 30 seconds later. <laughs> But um, I feel very honored to be here today um, and I'm also a bit surprised that they asked me to talk about the topic of love. Um, I heard they also had a second option of uh, a, another speaker that they wanted to ask who would have been an international porn star. Don't ask why they chose me. I apologize. Um, there won't be as much sex in my story. But I thought the least I can do is give you an honest love story. And that's what I'm going to tell you about now. So when I think about love, um, one of the first uh, persons that comes up in my mind is my history teacher. And that's not because I had a crush on him, but um, he was actually quite a funny guy. He was a kind of hippie type, gray hair, and he would always enter our classroom with a music recorder on his shoulder, and he would play the sound of the moon and the sun, and then we would draw mandalas to it. Um, so he was a bit of a, you know, special type. Um, and one day he entered the classroom and he asked us, what's the difference between being in love and love? And I'm pretty sure he looked at a bunch of 13-year-olds, pretty uninformed, who didn't have a clue. So 20 years later, I'm standing in front of you and I'm trying to find my answer to this question. I still remember how I fell in love with Europe. It all started when I was 18. Um, I'd grown up in Salzburg, which is a beautiful but slightly conservative place. And um, I was uh, 18, I had finished school and I was eager to go out there and, and see the world. So back then there were basically two options, which were go on au pair or do um, a world tour by yourself. So I wasn't too much of a kids person and I didn't have the balls to go and see the world by myself, but I found a European voluntary service. And that is a program by the European Commission that actually um, enables young people to go abroad for up to a year and they basically finance everything for you. They finance your travel, they give you an accommodation, they give you pocket money, they pay for your language course and you can then work in, um, in a social or cultural project. So I would say this is when Europe asked me out on the first date. And I was curious and I was young, so I accepted and I went to live in uh, Spain for a year. I was in Madrid and there I lived in a very typical L'Auberge Espanol flat. We were eight people from six different countries. We had um, this Italian couple who would constantly argue so loud that we were all basically involved in that relationship. But of course they could cook really well. Um, and we had this beautiful blonde Swedish girl who immediately fell in love with her Spanish language tandem and they're now married and have a baby. Um, <laughs> We had um, a gay French guy who had the worst language skill of all of us, but he could dance all night long. Um, and we had um, an English girl who was actually my roommate, and she was the one who taught me English and who also introduced me to Coldplay and to British chocolate. So you see, that was for me um, the first encounter with Europe. And, and for me, it was amazing. It was like a surprise egg. Every day there was something new and something enriching, something surprising. Um, we had our rooms plastered with vocabulary in six different languages and every day we would cook something else and we would show each other on the map where we were from and tell each other about how differently we celebrated Christmas or, or Easter, stuff like that. So this is what stuck with me and this is what Europe became to me. It was very much about differences, 
and about things that people and countries and cultures could show to me about the world that I hadn't known before. But of course, it wasn't always easy. Um, and we had to make quite an effort to understand each other and get across cultural and language barriers. But that also meant that when we did actually understand each other, that we really appreciated it a lot. So, I was in love with Europe and I have to say we had pretty beautiful first years. I then went back to Vienna and I started studying. I continued uh, learning languages like Spanish and French. Um, I started going on international youth conferences and I also, um, I also created some, um, some projects that were funded by the European Union as well. And one of them actually turned out to then be my first book that's also there that I wrote in 2009 where I spoke to young Europeans about how they perceive Austria and what kind of typical ideas they had about Austria. Um, so my entire life and also my career somehow got this European slant. I then started working at the, at the foreign ministry in Austria, I went to London um, to, uh, to work for the British Council and I also worked for European Forum Alpa. So basically you could say it was Europe all over. But like in every relationship, there came a time of crisis. I would say there was another temptation, a competition. It was another love, and actually in that time it was a man. It was a man who I met at an airport, and to me he was the perfect, handsome, tall stranger, and I immediately fell in love with him. And it was even more exciting because he was from a different uh, country, so our whole relationship somehow got this exotic, uh, exotic slant to it. Um, after a few months he decided to actually move to Austria for me. And I was happy, I thought, you know, that's amazing. Um, and then he revealed something to me that he hadn't really mentioned that much before, um, which was that he was head of communications of one of Europe's major right-wing parties. So that was a bit of a... <laughs> yeah? <laughs> That wasn't easy. So for two years, instead of, you know, having uh, romantic dinners and going out to the cinema together, we would actually sit in bars and discuss politics and philosophy and our understanding of life. And as you can imagine, that was pretty hard. Um, but I found out something that, that love did to this relationship. Um, I think quite often what we don't do with people that we don't love, but what we do with people that we love is that we look at what they are twice before, they, before we condemn them and we listen to what they say twice and we really try hard to understand. And I think as, as difficult as that time was, it really taught me an important lesson which was even in the most opposing positions there can always be a common ground, even if you just allow yourself to actually look for it. And even in positions like nationalism versus Europeanism, there can actually be this emotion that's, that's the basis of both, and that is the love for the people that you care about. So in a way he made me realize that before I had already condemned people myself because you know, they voted for the wrong party or they supported the wrong cause. And things aren't, never, things aren't ever that easy. Um, in a complex world like the one that we're living in, there isn't a simple right and a simple wrong. Things just aren't black and white. So I think that is what I took out of this relationship and that was a very important lesson to me, that in times like these, it's even more important to really listen and try to understand. So in the end, the relationship still didn't last. But as it's often the case with love, it was a sign that posted me into the direction that was right for me. And that was back to Europe. So, my relationship with Europe grew stronger. And I had the urge to actually make this official. It was time, you know, to get married. So, in 2015, I founded my company, which is called Mosaic. It's an agency for European communication projects. 
Um, and what I want to do with it is basically pass on this enriching experience that Europe has become to me. And by that, create a bit more of a, of a positive European spirit. In my experience, I think if we only have contact with one person from a country, we have more empathy towards that person. And also, if we have one experience in another country, if we travel there, if we've been there ourselves, we are more interested in what happens in that country. When I know someone in Scotland, I will be more eager to read a newspaper article about what's now happening after the Brexit. When I've been to Paris, I feel more touched when I hear about the attacks. Or when I cheer for Iceland in the Euro Cup, I'm actually more interested in hearing more about this rather unnoticed country in Europe. And I believe that if we actually get to know each other a bit more, and if we grow this empathy, that then will create a basis for cooperation, not only on a personal level, but ideally also on a political and economic level. So as you can see, Europe and me got quite serious. But I have to say, actually before we got married, I was already pregnant. And as a proud parent, of course, I want to present my babies to you. So, I've got them with me. My first baby is this. It's a card game. It's called Come on Over, or in German, Come to mir. And actually, the story how this got produced um, is also quite a European story. It all started with me and my friend Francois, who's here with us today as well. He's French and he was an Erasmus in Vienna and we actually went to Spanish lessons together. So this is how we met. And then years later we sat together and he said to me, look, I've got a games publishing house and you work so much on Europe, but there isn't a single game on Europe that's fun. So we decided let's create it together and let's actually prove that Europe can be quite a fun topic as well. And this is what we did. So, on your seats, you should have all found a card. And I thought instead of just talking too much about this game, I'll just show you how it works. In this game, there are two important elements. On one side, you will find situations. It's this side where you only see one, one suitcase. And on the other side, you will find fun facts about different European countries. They are all true, they're based on research, but they're also a bit weird, okay? So the way it works now is that we have one person who's actually traveling, and that person is in a weird situation, looking for an answer and looking for a solution. So I would now need someone who is our uh, traveler. Does someone have a really fun situation on their card? If so, please read it out now. Who wants to tell his situation? Please. I'm an alien and I want to learn about the human emotions. All right, Eva, we always knew it. You're not from here. Okay, so that's Eva's situation. She's an alien and she wants to know more about human emotions and we actually have to solve her problem for her. So what we do now is that on the second, uh, uh, on the other side, we find two fun facts. We choose one of them, one where we think it fits better to Eva's situation and then we create a story around that fun fact that will actually convince Eva to come to our country. Okay, who dares to try? No? Maybe my French partner? Sure, sure. Please. Yeah. Uh, so you're an alien, right? Yeah. I uh, am. If uh, please uh, come over to my place, so we don't we don't mention the name of the country. Because uh, uh, in my country, we carry around our women uh, upside down. And, uh, yeah, I know, uh, 
but once your head will be close to my 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 back and maybe even close to my butt, you, you will you'll get the feeling of human emotion quite quite <laughs> like, you know, just, uh, just not, not not only emotion, maybe, maybe a bit more also. <laughs> Thank you very much for that great story. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else who will try to convince Eva to come to their country? No. I would say, Eva, you should come on over to my country because I think actually we always misunderstand each other when we talk too much. And I think if you really want to understand human emotions, you have to find a different way of communication. And in my country, we communicate by whistling. And that's very much from the heart, you know, when you whistle. So you see, basically what we do is we tell her crazy stories. And it doesn't matter how stupid they are. It's just somehow finding a connection. And then what Eva would do is she chooses the story that she likes best. And that is basically the winner of the round. In the second part of the, of the game, you would also guess, of course, which countries you're from. And you can read out the more information. I'm not going to tell you too much about it because I don't have uh, all that much time, but you kind of get an idea what it does. It's, it's basically a creative storytelling game and it's supposed to really kind of create a positive approach to the topic of Europe and make you maybe even reconsider your stereotypes that you have in your head when you start guessing which facts belong to which countries. Okay, but of course that wasn't my only baby. There is actually a second baby that I'd like to introduce to you. Because that's the one that keeps me up all night at the moment. You know, the crying one. It's this one, it's Route 28. Um, and that's actually um, the, the biggest project that I've been working on with Mosaic so far. It's, um, it's a European journey in the middle of Vienna. The way I came up uh, with this project, um, this baby, um, was uh, together with uh, Stefan Apfel, who's now the chief editor of, of Datum, the magazine. We sat together and we said, well, both of us, we're actually, we feel very European, because we've had European experiences, we've traveled around, we, get, we got to know other people, we learned other languages. But there are a lot of people who don't really have that experience. So we thought what we want to do is kind of bring that experience to where they are and bring the European journey to where they are. So that's what we did. We created a European journey in the middle of Vienna. We set it up um, two months ago at the end of April as a prototype where we had 200 people and five stations. Uh, each station would represent a European country. There was, uh, we had Spain, Sweden, um, Poland, Great Britain and Romania. For instance, in Poland they would cook pierogi, in Spain they were in a private flat listening um, to Spanish music, in Great Britain, we also have Yashin here, um, they would listen to British comedy in a pub. And the idea of, uh, of this project is to really make people experience Europe and feel it, to make them curious, to create more knowledge about other European countries and by that actually grow understanding of who we actually are. Because we talk about Europe, but we don't really know who we are. We really have to get in contact more with each other. So that was a prototype that we set up now. And in 2017, we're trying to really make this big. We want to make a public and free event out of it where everyone in Vienna can join. And if that works out, then we actually want to really travel to Europe and go to other capitals and implement it as an event there as well. So these are just two of the projects, two of my babies um, that I wanted to present to you. So here I am now, I'm married to Europe, I've got kids, and every morning I wake up with Europe lying next to me, and of course it's not always easy. We have our good days, and we have our difficult days. For instance, we brought up that, uh, this card game in 2015. A few months later, um, the refugee situation grew really big in, in Austria and Europe. And our game had the title, come on over. We're like, okay, uh, maybe not the best title. And then two months ago, we set up um, this other project called Route 28, Brexit. Route 27, yeah, we're still thinking about a new title. So as you can see, there 
are actually probably more shiny and more I don't know, ideal partners that you could have by your side in these days other than Europe. But that's love, isn't it? It's just not perfect. It is. In another relationship I had, um, my then boyfriend said to me, darling, I think we will yet argue again and again. And I thought, that's really romantic. Because what it meant to me was that he was prepared to actually stick through hard times with me and that he wouldn't just quit and leave as soon as some problems arise. That he would actually treat an argument or, as a, or a crisis as a chance to grow together. So there is this uh, big European called Jean Monnet who once said, Europe will be created in crisis and it will be the sum of the solutions that we will find for that crisis. And I think this is where we are now. Europe is full of diversity and differences. And that means that there isn't only potential for crisis, but there is also potential for lots of creative solutions. And I think this is what I, what I love so much about Europe, or what I believe in. This is my version of Europe. That it's not so much about us all having to be the same, but actually being European to me means more that we are actually willing to deal with the differences that there are and to deal with the, with the consequences, with the problems that arise out of those differences. And I think we should actually use those differences far more. When you look at the European Union alone, we have 500, people, uh, 500 million people. We have 28 countries so far. We have 24 languages and lots of different regions, traditions, and then, like I said, differences. And as much as we hear about diversity being one of the biggest assets of Europe, I don't think we have to come to fully understand what, what that means and what we can take out of it. Because we can really get inspired by each other and learn from each other and even have fun with each other. And facing the crises that we're facing these days, it might sound even cynical or a bit banal to talk about fun. But I don't think it is. Look at Erasmus, for instance. Erasmus has been one of the most successful projects in entire European Union history, because what it does is that those drunken students and their shabby little flat shares all over Europe fall in love with each other and they create friendships. And that is what actually makes them feel European. So those emotions aren't trivia. They are actually really important to like each other, to have fun with each other, to get to know each other, because our emotions are our biggest driving force. And the more we close off, the more will that driving force be fear and anger and hate. And the more we open up to each other, will that driving force actually be empathy. And there's another thing I have learned about love, and that is that it doesn't always show itself in the same form. That there are actually a myriad of different ways of what love is. And I think one very small version of it could be just that. Empathy. Because empathy holds a very strong power. What it does is that in a world as complex and difficult and full of problems as ours, empathy leads to the moment where you stop and you look twice and you listen twice and you really try to understand. So that might not sound like the biggest love story, but I think it's worth a first date. And that's the beauty of first dates. Like you've just seen in my story, you never really know where it will take you. So coming back to my history teacher, that question, what's the difference between being in love and love? That really stuck with me. And a few years later, I found a quote by Max Frisch, a Swiss writer, who said, love is the willingness to follow a person in all their possible unfoldings. And what that means to me is that there is actually a core of a person. It's not so much about 
who that person is at the moment, what job they have, what they look like, who their friends are, but there is a core, a character, something deep within that person that won't change. And it's that core that you see and that you love. And I think this is also what Europe is to me. And maybe that would be my answer to my history teacher today, that I have seen this core in Europe and I believe in this core and I'm willing to follow it even longer. And maybe this is what you might call love. Thank you.